So we will start recording. Um, put away this participants. All right. So um, Matt and I will share the first presentation and we'll be talking of generally about mango production. And on our different slides, we're gonna have the links for uh, additional information and reading materials. So if you wanna dive deeper into some of the production information, please um, open up the PowerPoint presentation when we send it to you and you can click on the links and learn more. Um, after that, we'll have Dr. Lisa Keith. She's going to be talking about uh, some of the preliminary results from a research trial that she's working on with essential oils. And then following Dr. Keith, we'll have Jensen Ueda. He's going to be talking about um, the use of potassium nitrate to stimulate off-season mango production. Uh, and then we'll open it up to question and answers. So I'll kind of bounce between um, the group here in, in Kona as well as those that join us on, um, on Zoom. And then we'll take a short break. Uh, those of you who are here, please uh, make sure you fill out a waiver form so that when we walk up to the station, uh, we can see the field demo that Jensen did on some of the mango trees that we have here and the use of potassium nitrate um, here. So uh, before we begin, I wanted to thank our funding and support agencies that help us to put on events like this, help us to conduct research as well as provide the information back to you through extension. Um, and they are USDA, USDA NIFA, UHC TAR, Cooperative Extension, as well as the Hawaii Department of Agriculture. So I'm gonna have uh, Matt start with our mango production in Hawaii presentation, and um, I'll have him come up. So we'll just start with a little bit of a table of contacts. We'll do some fun facts. So mango statistics, production in Hawaii, insect and pest diseases of mango and how to manage them, physiological disorders and post-harvest handling. So uh, we've got dozens of different varieties, as you can see on our Hawaiian mangoes poster there. Um, the Guinness World Record, is 9.36 pound mango from Colombia. I do not believe the variety was mentioned. Um, the local record is five, about five and a half pounds, I believe, from Kona. Uh, most of our production is from June to September. Though we have varieties like Golden Glow that can bear earlier or Julie can have multiple blooms in the season. Uh, most flowers function as males and provide pollen but some are bisexual and set fruit as well. And pollination are, um, is done by flies, wasps, and bees. So a little bit of production in Hawaii. We see mangoes got a total of 15,100 plants and 6,600 of those were harvested. And this is from the uh, National Agricultural Statistics Service from 2020. So I think the data was actually from 2016. So we have a few other crops here that you can compare to. And in that year, 2016, um, the total, and this was for all tropical crops and tropical citrus and tropical specialty crops. So 2.7 million uh, trees harvested for 9.6 million pounds and a total farm value of $13.3 million. So globally, we've got 43 million tons of uh, mangoes being produced, and that's the eighth most produced fruit in the world. Between 2000 and 2013, we had 75% rise in production. And even though the crop is grown all over the tropics, um, Asian countries produce 72% of the world's uh, production, and Africa catches 17%, Latin America produces 10%. So as you see on the graph on the right there, um, India's up there with 16.1 million tons in 2012, and that catches most of the world's uh, production right there. Here are some common variety, varieties of mango that you can find sold and um, that you can buy like grafted trees locally. So uh, mangoes prefer elevation um, from sea level to 1,500 feet. 
um, and most productive below 1200 feet. They prefer hot, dry leeward tides, um, less than 60 inches of annual rainfall. And in those conditions, you'll want supplemental irrigation for the best production. And if you look at that map on the right side, the light orange, dark orange, and the red will represent the um, 2000 millimeters and below rainfall. And that'll be about, so 1500 uh, millimeters is about 60 inches. So those are like your prime growing areas. Uh, your best production is when weather is dry and calm during flowering. You can grow it in a wide, a wide range of soils from light sandy loams to red clay between pH 5.5 and 7.5. And your best production is gonna be um, on rich deep soils where you can get a nice top root and where the soil is well-drained and moderately sloped. So propagation is normally done through grafting. Um, so your monoembryonic varieties do not produce true to seed, and that's your primary reason to graft. Um, polyembryonic varieties, which are most of the common mangoes and wine mangoes, they can be grown from tree, uh, seed without grafting. And this picture on your left here, so the left is a monoembryonic site, and the right side is a polyembryonic seed that grows two um, basically clones of the mother plant. Your grafted trees are gonna grow a little bit slower than your seedlings, and they'll grow slower and be smaller, but they'll produce uh, fruit in the first three to five years, whereas a seedling will be more closer to five years. And the common varieties or common methods of propagating are like in arcing or top working or like an approach graft. So fertilization boxes, you wanna use a general 111, so like a triple 16 or a 10, 20, 20 uh, formulation. Your phosphorus is going to be important for root development and establishment. And your nitrogen and potassium are going to be necessary for good yields when your tree is in production. For young trees, you'll want 1.5 to 3 ounces of nitrogen in year one. And you up that to 3 to 5 ounces in year two to three. And you'll split that over three to four separate applications throughout the year. And preferably before growth flushes. For barren trees, you'll do one pound of complete fertilizer per year for each inch of trunk diameter measured four to five feet above ground level. Half will be applied before flowering and the rest after the crop is harvested. And supplemental nitrogen will be applied just before flowering. So, so could you, again, on that one? Yeah. Uh, a one pound for Every... Yeah, so one pound of complete fertilizer per year for each inch of trunk diameter. So you go four to five feet up, and I, I guess you can either take the circumference and calculate that, or I guess just estimate with like your yardstick or something. These are very general recommendations. Yeah. You really should be doing fish and soil sampling to identify what the trees really need for your particular area. So your low temperature is the key environmental condition to that'll influence your flowering. Water is not responsible for flower induction, but could enhance the response for to cool temperatures. The emergence of flower panicles in the main bloom take place between December and April, although this can uh, swing by based on the variety of tree you have. And same thing, the fruits mature in three to five months after flowering, which is also variety dependent. So Jensen will talk about using potassium nitrate to stimulate flowering. But when uh, Nagawa and Nishina, they tried in Hawaii, and they found that two to 4% potassium nitrate sprays stimulating uh, flowering on mature mango trees early in the season. So, uh, Mature mango tree can stay in production for 40 years or more. And fruits are, in Hawaii are harvested usually three to five months after flowering. Uh, so that'll be June to September. And after they develop a little bit of color, 
and that's uh, also variety dependent. Uh, mango is climacteric fruit, so it'll continue to ripen after it's off the tree. And that, depending on cultivar, state of, of maturity at harvest and post-harvest conditions, the fruit should be picked before they're fully ripe and kept in cool, dry environment once they're harvested. I think there was something that's weird that in total shade, they don't make that color either. <laughs> Need a little sunlight to get some color. Yeah, another <laughs> tree is incorporating it and they're staying green for the right. So oh, interesting. The ones were out in the sun. Andrew will take over for the insect pests. All right, thanks, Matt. Uh, so I'll go through some of the field insect pests of mango and fruit flies, as well as mango seed weevil are your top insect pests for this crop. Um, we also do see different uh, types of scales, uh, thrips, midges in the blossoms, stink bug damage, some caterpillar damage on the young shoots, as well as some black twig borer, which can be found on many different crops. So um, some of the photos show you what the fruit fly damage is on the left. Um, there's a Mediterranean fruit fly there and an Oriental fruit fly on the bottom, as well as mango seed weevil on the right, um, the weevil itself and the different stages of its life cycle there on the bottom. So um, these pests can shorten the, the shelf life of the fruit. It can reduce the quality of the fruit and even affect the flavor of the fruits as well, cause um, premature ripening or dropping of the fruits. So it can greatly affect the yield and the quality of the fruit coming out of Hawaii. So it's important to control these pests and manage them. For fruit flies, uh, we use a, an easy as one, two, three fruit fly uh, suppression method of control. Um, your main thing is going to be field sanitation, identifying what type of fruit fly you have, uh, learning about its life cycle, as well as some of the other host plants that it might affect. Um, in field sanitation, we're looking at picking up drop fruit, damaged fruit, uh, infested fruit, and removing it from the field and destroying those fruit so that the life cycles cannot continue in your field. For the different fruit flies, we can use uh, monitoring as well as um, baits, traps, and lures to try and kill the, the fruit flies and to reduce the populations in the field. And overall, just monitoring and reevaluating what you're doing and how it's affecting your bottom line will help you to uh, maintain control on this pest. So for um, Mediterranean fruit, fruit fly, you can use GF120 as well as BioLure. And for oriented fruit flies, you could use even a product uh, with methyl eugenol um, to try and manage these pests in the field and to reduce the populations. For mango seed weevil, um, it's good to understand their life cycle with your crop. So during the flowering period, the adults are mating, they're laying eggs as the fruits are starting to develop, the larvae are developing in the fruit. And then during the harvest, the larvae start to pupate and emerge. So again, sanitation is going to be really important, removing the damaged fruits, fruit on the ground. Um, the adult weevils actually do find their way into the bark, loose bark of the tree, and they might stay there. So uh, chemical methods can also help to control the adults if it's allowed here in Hawaii on different products. Um, but really, the field sanitation is going to be one of the biggest steps to controlling mango seed weevil. Uh, if you see little black spots on the fruit um, that look like sap, there might be a mango seed weevil egg under there. So, you know, knowing what to look for on fruits that have been damaged or um, infested by seed weevil, uh, it's a good way of being able to identify those fruits and then removing them uh, and destroying those fruits. Some of the common diseases of mango include anthracnose and powdery mildew. Uh, we also see some stem rot as well as sooty mold, which is an after effect of sucking insects like scale and aphids. Uh, the photos on the right show anthracnose, which can affect the fruit, mature fruit, young fruit, flowers, um, as well as some of the terminal branches as well. And it 
it causes this blackening of um, the tissues and death of the tissues, premature fruit drop as well. It is a um, marketability issue as well on the, the mature fruits. Um, powdery mildew tends not to affect the fruit, but you can see it on the leaves, flowers, sometimes the immature fruits that may fall off as well as the branches. So for control of these um, site selection where you're growing the mangoes is really important. Like Matt said, hot, dry areas at lower elevation tend to be better areas where mangoes grow well um, and are less affected by anthracnose. In hotter areas, you might see powdery mildew, um, but that can also be controlled with some fungicide sprays. Cultivar selection can also be important. Uh, Hawaii, as well as Australia, they point out that Carrie and Tommy Atkins can be a little more resistant to anthracnose, uh, but you also have other tolerant varieties like Early Glow, Edward, Florgon, Glenn, Heat, Julie, Raposa, and Van Dyke. Uh, making sure that your plant spacing is also adequate for the size of the tree that you're uh, raising in the field, making sure that adequate sunlight, airflow, and low humidity is in the field, um, you get a lot of airflow through the trees, so it helps to dry out some of the excess moisture that might be conducive to anthracnose. Uh, if you've got larger trees, you want to at least plant them 25 to 30 feet apart. If you've got smaller dwarf trees, you can go a little tighter, 12 to 15 feet apart. But again, just making sure that airflow and sunlight penetration is adequate for your trees. We can also use pruning to um, help open up the tree canopies, get better airflow, and to reduce the height of trees so that spray applications, harvesting, and other cultural practices are easier to do in the field. So we recommend pruning trees at least annually to remove diseased branches and panicles <coughs> that might host anthracnose and powdery mildew. Uh, you can use preventative fungicide applications prior to um, and during the flower and young fruit set periods although we wanna make sure that we're not actually spraying bees while they're actively foraging and to protect our pollinators. You might have to do weekly to monthly sprays depending on your rainfall as well as disease pressure in the field just to maintain management on uh, anthracnose and powdery mildew. Once the fruit are harvested, there are, are, there are post-harvest treatments um, which include refrigeration um, at about 50 degrees Fahrenheit, hot water dips, vapor heat or forced air dry heat and fungicide dips. And that will help to also prevent the additional um, development of some of the diseases on the fruit. So is the refrigeration the same as the hot water dips or is it a longer time? So refrigeration is just to keep the fruit cool. All the time because if it's not ripe, it says to get out so it's ripe. Yeah, so these are fully mature ripe fruit. Um, I will talk a little bit more about like chilling injury, injury in um, the next couple of slides. Uh, so physiological disorders that you might see in mango fruit are mango jelly seed, stem end cavity or decay, soft nose, and then you can also get sap burn from allowing the sap to sit on the, the fruit rind. So jelly seed and soft nose are probably the most common uh, most harvest physiological disorders that you'll see once you cut open the fruit. They're not that easy to see when the fruit is whole, but once you cut it open, jelly seed can look like a really mushy, watery flesh around the seed. Um, and that can usually turn the flavor off also. So you won't have as good tasting of a fruit. Some uh, cultivars are more uh, ad adverse to this physiological disorder and they can be Tommy Adkins and Hayden. Uh, there may be other varieties also. Soft nose and jelly seed, um, some of the research kind of points towards the direction of calcium deficiency, but more research is needed to really identify what truly is the cause of uh, both of these diseases. Stem end cavity, um, some of the diseases have been found to be connected to this decay of the fruit. Um, as the name says, it's on, on the stem end of the fruit that starts to rot. Um, again, soft nose, you'll see it in the mature fruit. Seems to be a calcium deficiency problem, but again, research needs to show what truly is the, the cause of that. Um, keeping up the plant and fruit nutrition can help to um, 
reduce the effects of jelly seed and soft nose in the field. And washing fruit with water and detergent can help to reduce sap burn uh, by washing off the sap that's left on the skin. And some of the handling uh, of mango that you should be considering um, helps to reduce disease, diseases and to extend shelf life of mature mangoes. Uh, storage at 50 to 55 degrees Fahrenheit at relatively high humidity can give additional shelf life for mature fruits up to two to four weeks. Um, if you're storing ripe fruit at about 45 degrees Fahrenheit, that can also help to extend the shelf life. However, you don't want to store unripe fruit at lower temperatures um, like that, and that can cause injury to the skin. And so you can kind of see some of the photos there on the right of Keat, which has chilling injury. You'll see some pitting on the skin. Uh, you might see some browning and decay. You'll see that some of the lenticels will get a little discolored or reddened, blackened. Um, some of them will almost be white as well. So some of the, um, those are some of the uh, observations you might see on the fruit if they're getting chilling injury. Ethylene gas can be used to enhance uniform fruit softening. It doesn't necessarily make it riper, um, but it can help to soften the fruit so it's more palatable. But using ethylene to treat immature fruits can lead to soft fruit with poor flavor because they're, they're not actually going to ripen properly. So if you've got uh, ripe fruit, uh, the optimal temperature to be holding them at is um, 68 to 73 degrees for best appearance flavor and to help with decay. Mm -hmm. But you need to eat them quickly. <laughs> so um, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Lisa Key. Uh, she's gonna be talking about her project with essential oils. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you, everyone. Well, this is definitely a collaborative effort um, with my lab in Hilo. Uh, Andrea and Matt, all for the extension. We're on from there. You wait. And our grower cooperator, Ho'omalu Farm. Right, let me. Okay. Um, so again, thanks. We're, this is a multi-year grant, which I'll get into, but this is the preliminary kind of first season uh, data that we've collectively taken. And Andrea started out, you know, the pathology, um, some of the major issues, powdery mildew and anthracnose. And these diseases pretty much plague mango no matter where they're grown in the world. Okay, so I'll just kind of go forward on this. Um, but oidium is sorry. Oh, it's not sharing screen. Uh, sorry, might need to start over, Lisa. <laughs> All right, we're gonna get this. Sorry about that. Let's... I could see. Okay, thanks. <laughs> All right. Sorry about that. Do you want me to? to no need to go back then. Okay. Yeah, they can hear you, but they couldn't see. Oh, okay. Barrier. Okay. So again, really just the major issues of anthracnose, powdery mildew that plagues mango production around the world. Um, as Andrea already mentioned, um, the information you'll have again to get back to these slides, it's all about integrated management. Okay, no one silver bullet, but the combination of a lot of things really can help alleviate the, the issues um, caused by these pathogens. Okay. So you may have actually noticed um, in 2020 in our local paper that this very large multi-state grant was awarded um, with the University of Florida uh, as the, the project director. 
um, but it is an interdisciplinary project with 15 scientists um, from five universities, um, Ag Research Service in Hilo, and so Florida, South Carolina, um, Hawaii, and California, looking at um, mango, peaches, um, avocado, blueberry, trying to help organic uh, production because there's very little products that can be used for organic production. So it was focusing on essential oils and could these actually be used to fight the major issues of these respective crops in the various states. And so for us here in Hawaii, we'd be looking at powdery mildew and anthracnose uh, on mango. Okay, so to really quickly go over um, the multi-year objectives, number one, um, evaluate plant safety and the potential for control. And a lot of this work begins in the laboratory instead of immediately jumping into the field, okay? Once you figure out, well, what do the products do and how well do they work actually combating the, the fungi that we're interested, um, objective two was to move on to the farms and see if we could get disease suppression uh, using these products in comparison to what is typically done by the grower, okay? So how does it affect disease in the field? And then how does it uh, affect post-harvest issues? And that's kind of what I'll, I'll present today. And then all the while um, disseminate this information to you, the growers, um, kind of in real time. Okay, so we collected 14 um, Colletotricum species isolates um, locally. So actually causing disease here in Kona, um, purified them, stored them in our culture collection, did some work, but then also sent them to Florida for them to actually characterize. So all of the Colletotricum species ended up in Florida um, from avocado and mango to do comparisons to actually see what species are causing disease. And a lot of it is done, not only looking at what they look like growing on the plate, which is what you see, um, but molecularly as well. So looking at a variety of genes to try to determine um, what species of Colletoctricum are present. But what we found for Hawaii, we actually, there are two uh, common species, Tropicali and Asianum, and their broad host range Colletotricum species um, that are actually found worldwide. So I guess in a way, maybe that's a good thing. It's not some specialized, you know, thing here that generally plagues, again, uh, mango production. Okay, so now they had um, all of these isolates and how do they grow? How to optimize um, the inoculum source. So the spores are what actually start causing the disease. So the left picture shows growing on a plate. Um, the peach are those infectious propiules. Okay, so they figured out, well, what kind of media do we use? And then the right picture is actually then putting individual isolates, inoculating onto fruit to see if there's a difference in aggressiveness. Okay. And you can see, yes, there are actually based on symptomology. So after 10 days, and I'm going to mention um, the names up at the top, okay, give all credit to the people and the locations that you see. And this is the pictures that they shared. Okay, so again, with aggressiveness on the right, you could see after 10 days, not all isolate behaves the same way. Okay, some disease and the symptomology is actually um, more severe than others. And the purpose of that was really to find the most aggressive isolates to then test the products against, okay? And in vitro screening, again, um, on plates here, how, how does it affect growth? I mean, what does it do? And best to try to see in the lab first before you conduct a big field trial. So the pictures you're seeing and the questions being asked are, does Time Guard, okay, so that's one product, and Timorex Gold, that was the other product. Um, time Guard actually has a 23% Time Oil, and Timorex is tea tree oil, okay? 
So while these laboratory experiments were going on, what you're actually looking at is just um, different concentrations in the media that the fung fungi are growing on. Um, the bottom left is the control. So there's no product in that plate. And you can see, okay, in a matter of days, the fungus grows the whole, it covers the whole plate. So now how does that compare with various concentrations of the product? Well, I'm thinking right away, you're gonna notice time guard definitely inhibits growth. The t -merex, the tea tree oil, is not effective against these Colotopricum species, which was good to know before we started putting it out into the field, okay? But in the meantime, what we were trying to do is see if there's a phytotoxic effect of these chemicals first, okay? So pretty simply stated, um, we would put the products in a certain concentration into spray bottles. We actually labeled, <clears throat> excuse me, some panicles, um, did spraying weekly for four weeks straight, went out every week to see, well, what does the product do to the leaves, to the inflorescence? I mean, you got to make sure it's not going to somehow um, be inhibitory or cause damage. Okay. Um, so while we looked at both products, because at this stage, we weren't sure what was going to go out into the field yet, um, but happy to say, uh, looking at a high rate and a low rate of both, um, there was no phytotoxic effect. So that was great to see that now it is potential of using essential oils, particularly Time Guard, um, because we could see it would in fact affect the growth, at least in culture. Now the challenge really begins. What does it do in the field? Okay, so set it up randomly in the field, selecting the individual trees as a rep. We would then tag panicles of the two varieties we're looking at, um, Raposa and Manzanillo, and went with the high treatment. They figured if the high treatment's not going to work, at least for this preliminary first season, um, well, we'll have to make some adjustments. But um, time guard at the high label rate, you could see 0.5%. That's about two quarts in 100 gallons. And it was compared to the grower standard practice of using copper and sulfur. Okay, um, Sulfur was applied for powdery mildew control. Um, and that's there, there when particularly is, well, when do you need to attack these pathogens? And powdery mildew is pretty uh, new on the panicles as far as the flowers, the buds. And then copper was applied um, primarily really for anthracnose control. Once a month until fruit harvest, uh, the products are applied with sprayers until near runoff. And then we start to take the data and do consistent just collection over the season. And I'll, I'll mention that just due to the nature of the trees that were selected and the stages of the panicles, um, copper sprays, the copper sulfur actually got started a little earlier. So by the end of the season, um, there were six treatments for the grower control trees versus about four um, for the time guard, okay? But again, what we looked at is severity ratings and actually calculated the percent severity of these tagged panicles overall um, for the powdery mildew and anthracnose. And also then trying, um, we were hoping to follow the fruit development of the tagged panicles that we could then uh, carry into the post-harvest treatments, okay? So the first sprays occurred in December, 2021. Uh, disease evaluation uh, conducted every two weeks um, through harvest. Okay, so just a basic summary. Um, we definitely saw some varietal and seasonal effects. Okay, so it depended on if we were looking at Manzanillo or Raposa. Um, we did see an increase in powdery mildew severity for both. Okay, right now it looked like um, the copper sulfur was working a little better, but it did not seem like it affected the panicle or the fruit set um, moving forward. It didn't matter if we were using the essential oil 
or the standard practice, okay? Happy to report, actually, we saw basically no anthracnose in the field for the whole length of time. Um, but like I say, and you know, it's the challenge of, of science and nature, um, the tagged panicles didn't always have the fruits that we could carry into the post-harvest, but we still conducted um, post-harvest studies and it didn't matter what products were being used, the same amount of fruits that were seen on, on the various panicles, okay? So this takes us into the objective three, the post-harvest. Um, thankfully, the fruits were harvested and packed by the growers. Boxes contained four to six fruit, uh, depending on the variety and the treatment. We then brought back the fruit um, to Hilo, held it at that optimum temperature for the duration of the trial. And then we were assessing, okay, at what stage of ripeness and then the incidence of disease, meaning, well, if you look at 10 fruit and all 10 have at least a spot, well, that's 100% incidence, but I guess more importantly, what was the severity? So for each individual fruit, what percentage was affected by primarily um, the anthracnose pathogen? So looking at days say, 0, 7, 14, and here's an update of the experiments. Okay, so again, two different varieties, um, two different harvest states, and then comparing the copper sulfur control versus time guard. And I then tried to, so I've given you numbers. It doesn't have statistics. We're still analyzing the statistics, um, but then give some summaries at the bottom, okay? So the average rating was calculated um, at these ripe and overripe stages, okay? I guess happy to, um, at least right now, uh, present that the symptoms were present it, regardless, I mean, I guess that's not a good thing. Unfortunately, there were symptoms, but it was regardless of the treatment, okay? So particularly at day seven, you can see that um, day zero, most fruits look lovely, okay? As it's being held into day seven, into becoming more ripe, okay, we started to see disease. But all of the, the values, essentially, that severity level, it didn't seem to really make a difference for the variety or for the product used, which is a good thing, saying maybe there is potential with this essential oil. However, once the fruit started to get overripe, and you can see in that far right column, day 14, you start to see a little bit of a difference between the standard method and um, the essential oil time guard, okay? Um, again, the take home message right now, there's no obvious difference between treatments at day seven, okay? To me, that's, that's great moving forward. Um, by day 14, even slightly less than that, we're talking about overripe fruit, okay? So um, results suggest fruit, I mean, you guys know this, you're the experts, um, should be sold and really consumed by that seven day mark. And definitely moving forward, we are excited to look at this product again. Okay, so what are we planning for this next year? Um, definitely the second round. So the results of this first trial will help us um, moving forward for the second rep to actually optimize the application timing and frequency. And so you have to remember that Time Guard actually got less treatments, and even at seven days, it's still looking pretty good post-harvest. So that's what I'm saying. I think, wow, what happens if you actually now look at an equal treatment number, okay? Um, moving into the post-harvest trials, um, some of the other crops, they're actually artificially inoculating, but we'll definitely continue with that natural um, inoculum that's present perhaps even a later spread, okay? Because if we see, wow, it, it could have been maybe, maybe more than two months from the last spray. So if it's closer to harvest time with that essential oil, perhaps that'll even uh, help into the post-harvest, okay? And again, we look forward to sharing our updates with you. And I say thank you. And again, thank the team.
Um, really appreciate all the help with uh, Ho'omalu Farm, Brooks and Billy, uh, Lionel and Ava in my lab, and Andrea and Matt. And I'll help answer questions after. Thank you. All right, next up we have Jensen and he'll be talking about uh, the use of potassium nitrate to induce off-season flowering of mango. Yes, it should still be recording. Correct, Matt? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, I can introduce myself again. I'm Jensen Weta. I'm an extension agent on Oahu. I work with edible crops, including fruit trees and other vegetable crops. Um, this project came about a few buyers on Oahu were asking me for mango that's local mango that wasn't typically when our seasons normally are. Um, so I was asked for mango in December, January, and February, which is not necessarily common for Hawaii. So that's how this project came about. I got funding from the Department of Ag Special Crop Block Grant. Um, a lot of the work is based on Dr. Nagao's and the potassium nitrate used to stimulate off-season flower or flower production or increased flower production. So commonly, mango is typically available during the summer months up into September, uh, de October, depending on the variety. Um, we do import a lot of the mangoes from other countries, other states. So the idea was to get around that import market and get product in after that market is done so that you can still maintain that local premium when you're not competing with that outside market. So from what I gathered from literature, I mean, California season typically ends in September, Mexico is October. Um, and that's just some general old stats on import numbers. Um, so the idea was to get outside of that October market and have fruit from October on. Uh, and that's why this project got started. Um, this is an old, not, not old, uh, a diagram of what's physiologically kind of going on within that mango plant. And some of the stimulus that occur on the plant itself to either initiate flowering, whether it's chilling, defoliation, pruning, applications of nitrogen fertilizers, uh, ethylene, cytokinins, and then the induction of flower production or vegetative shoot production. So there's different physiological processes within the plant that happen in response to some of these outside stimulus or inside stimulus. Um, so one of the things that I pulled out of this chart was the use of gibberellic acid. So GA3 was the product that I selected as a mechanism to inhibit flower production and stimulate vegetative um, production. The idea was I stopped flower production in that December to January period. And then now we can induce flowering after that. So we stopped the tree from flowering its natural period so that it's ready to go after that. So we have fruit in that October on market. Um, and we can't necessarily make our climate colder. So the use of that potassium nitrate would be our stimulus to trigger flowering outside of that normal flowering period. So the first trial I did was two years ago or in 2021. Uh, this is the product I use, uh, gibberellic acid three uh, from this company, Phytotech. Uh, from the publications I read, they recommended a rate of 300 parts per million. So we were using about half a liter of water per tree as our volume of water that we sprayed onto the tree. So the calculation comes out to about 15 or 0.15 grams of gibberellic acid per tree. Um, and then after that period, getting into that February, March um, period of, of appli applicating potassium uh, nitrate, uh, we're putting down about that 3%. So Andrea mentioned is between two to 4%. I selected a middle number at 3%. So that's about 15 grams of potassium nitrate per tree in that half liter of water. So that half liter of water is basically how much water it takes me to cover the tree canopy with the spray. 
If it's a larger tree, you're probably going to have to increase the volume of water, meaning you're going to have to increase the concentration of either the gibberellic acid or the potassium nitrate. So when we applied the GA, it was in February. It was a little late because of this project started a little late. It got gibberellic acid a little late. We did stop a lot of the flowering on the trees during that period, but there were already flowers initiated on that tree. So I had to cut off all those flowers just to make sure that our tree had no flower and fruit for that potassium nitrate applications. Which would which happened in uh, uh, when did I put July June? So the system, the spray system I was using was this backpack mist blower. If you're doing a larger field, you can increase that spray application by modifying your sprayer. So I'm still working on the publication and the video on how to build it. Um, I do have information on the steps. It's just not in a uh, formatted form yet, uh, but basically you can turn a leaf blower into a, a mist sprayer by just adding on a spray tank to that leaf blower to get more volume of water and not having to have to carry four gallons of water on your back. Anyway, I did use that four gallon leaf blower. I put an individual amount of water per tree and sprayed each individual tree separately uh, using that backpack mist blower system. And this just helps to get even coverage on the tree canopy. If you're using like a hand pump sprayer you're not necessarily getting enough push with a hand backpack hand pump spirit to get chemical up into the, the tree canopy. So you might not get good uniform coverage of that product, meaning you're not going to get good flower or um, inhibit inhibition of the flower if you don't get good coverage. So prior to applications, you can see some of the trees already have flower initiation on them. Um, that's about the level of flower initiation during that February month. Um, so this is about when we sprayed the gibberellic acid on the gibberellic acid treatments. Um, and then we came in and sprayed potassium nitrate. Um, so you can see the GA treated trees on the left with no flower. Um, I did spray a set of trees with potassium nitrate in that February month just to see what it did for enhanced fruit initi or flower initiation. And then the untreated trees, you can see the uh, pretty mature fruit uh, as well as uh, flower set on those trees. Um, two months later, after that potassium nitrate application, you can see the GA tree that got potassium nitrate um, is now starting to show flower initiation. Um, and then the, the two trees that received potassium nitrate early and did not get treated at all, they're starting to get into that mature fruit phase where you're starting to harvest fruit now. Um, and then in August, basically all the fruit are basically ready to ready to harvest from that control, as well as the potassium treatments. And now you're starting to get about golf ball size to a little bit bigger than golf ball size fruit on that potassium nitrate treated trees. And then in September, basically all the fruit is off the, the early trees. And then that gibberellic acid with the late potassium nitrate application is now starting to get more mature fruit, almost ready for harvest. And then in October, now you have fruit ready for harvest while everything else has nothing on them. So now we're getting fruit into that late, later months where we're now can get it into the market after the rest of the world has stopped shipping product to Hawaii. That's kind of the idea of why that we did that timing. Um, but then I wanted to see how far I could push that production. So instead of just trying to get to that October market, I wanted to see if we can push it out to January, February, if possible. So you can see I pushed the applications further back into uh, May, June, July um, is when I applied the, uh, sorry, the potassium nitrate. All of the trees got the gibberellic acid on, in that February month. Um, because the trees are a little bigger, I increased the volume of water. So you can see the 1,000 mils or one liter versus that 500 I started earlier. So all I did was just double the amount of product I put into that mixture of water. Um, and then below, you can see the expected um, harvest and flowering dates per treatment. So um, the idea is that last treatment in in July, we would start to see fruit set or fruit harvest in December, January is what we're trying to get to. So this is still ongoing. I just sprayed these trees two months ago. So I'm only, only have data for what I was able to collect up until this point. Um, so this is just kind of a field map of how that field was arranged. The colors just determine the treatments and I replicated each one 
four times. So there's four tree replicates per treatment. So um, this one is year two. So meaning these are the trees that got the gibberellic acid and that late potassium nitrate application last year. Um, that's what year two um, represents. So you can see you can see in July there's fruit. Uh, sorry, fruit set, and then as of two weeks ago or a week ago, um, that's what the fruit looks like now on that tree. For that normal uh, May application, so it's about the same time period as it was last year if we applied in that May application. Um, same thing with the year one. So this, these trees are the first time I'm spraying GA on them as well as that May application of potassium nitrate. So you can see uh, a month, about a month later, you'll start to see that flower initiation and then the fruit set in September, October. What variety Sorry, this is all reposos. The whole orchard is reposo. Everything's on reposo. Just because I had this orchard available to me, just in case I killed it, it was a UH field of trees. Um, they're about four years old, four to five years old now, just to give you some reference. Um, June applications. So on the left, you can see the flower initiation a month later, uh, fruit set in August. And as of last week, you can see some of the fruit starting to mature. Um, and then this is last month's or July's application. So in August, we did have another set of flower initiation. Um, and then this month, you're starting to see the pea size fruit start to develop on top of the trees. So hopefully this set of fruit is gonna be ready in July if it stays on the tree. So right now, all we're doing is monitoring fruit set at maturity, I guess you can say. So uh, what I've been doing is kind of counting the fruit that's left on the trees at harvest to kind of quantify how much fruit is left on the tree. So this kind of represents what I could collect as of now. So um, if you can see the ones on the right, there's basically four or five fruit per tree. And a lot of that is because um, this orchard is located in Waimanalo on Oahu, where typically during flower and fruit set, it's raining every day. So you have a lot of anthracnose, you have a lot of that powder mildew affecting that flowering and fruit set. So we do get a lot of reduced yields because of that rainfall pattern during that flower period. So that's why you see that lower yield in that area. Um, that Gen 2 represents uh, the, the amount of fruit set that happened uh, that I was able to collect last month. Um, and then uh, the bar on the left is also sprayed in May, harvested, expected harvest in October. So I counted the number of fruit that would probably make it to harvest based on those numbers. So you can see a reduced amount of yield um, in that Gen 2 plant. But statistically, I haven't run the statistics yet. Statistically, they're about uh, numerically they're about the same. Um, anywhere from for the Gen twos, about five fruit per tree, all the way up to sixty fruit. Where the first year applications were about thirty-five to ninety fruit per tree. So just by pushing it out a couple months later, where you're starting to get into that drier period, we just get natural increase in fruit set just because of that lack of rainfall during that period. So even if you're not trying to get into that later season market, this could be a potential strategy to run away from that anthracnose and pottery mildew issues if you're in a wet area during that natural flowering period. Does that make sense? Um, and then when I sprayed the demo up here, I also sprayed a few trees at our Pearl City Urban Garden Center, which has a collection of maybe 30 different varieties. So I've only been doing this work on reposas. So I wanted to see what the response would be to some of these other varieties. <laughs> so I sprayed this last month in August 24th, and I took these pictures yesterday. So uh, reposa, that's a one-year-old tree already showing flower initiation with application. Um, Keat also showed a little bit of flower initiation. Um, this Namdak Mai has some flower initiation. Um, Austin showed some and Govea showed some, but that Fairchild is kind of exploding with flower production right now. 
Um, a lot of it is the timing of application from my observations. So the when you apply the potassium nitrate, there has to be pretty mature buds on that wood, meaning the buds have to be ready to break when they're naturally probably going to push out leaf vegetation because of the time of year. If you put the potassium nitrate on during that period, that new flush is not going to be leaves. They're going to be flowers. So some of these trees that don't have a lot of that initiation is because there's already flushed leaf that came out or the, the, the leaf, the buds on them aren't mature enough to push out vegetation yet. Does that make sense? I have some examples here for those of you here on what I kind of mean by that maturation of the buds. My Oregon roots twice almost every year. So that might be a, yeah, I've got green fruits on the side of my hand right now. It just flushes out automatically. Yeah. So Give them a little boost. Yeah. Right, really. So I think one of the ideas with this program was if you have a large enough orchard, and you don't want to harvest all of your trees all at once, you can kind of trigger them to be harvested every month, right? So say you have 500 trees, you can spray all of them with gibberellic acid or spray 400 with gibberellic acid. So you have 100 to harvest in October, you have, or September, you have 100 to harvest October, November, and December based on this spray application pattern, right? Then you're not harvesting 500 trees all at once, taking fruit at a time, you can focus on a, a set of 100 trees every month and not have to spend so much time walking through your whole orchard. That's one application uh, technique for this, this method. The other is if, okay, you did have poor fruit set, you can still come back in and spray the potassium nitrate to increase that flower production for the rest of the tree. Um, some of the trees that we sprayed just had poor flower set. So we came in and just sprayed them just to see what would happen. And they'll initiate more flower, even if they put out flower previously. Will that burn the uh, existing flowers and all the potassium nitrate? It's such a small quantity that I haven't had any problem with burning the flowers or fruit set from the previously established flowers on the tree. I've had uh, burning of foliage. Yeah, so at the concentration that we're spraying with this product with potassium nitrate and the surfactant I used was kinetic. It's a penetrating silicone surfactant. None of that had any phytotoxicity on the leaf, the flower, or the original fruit that were still on that tree when I sprayed the application. That's 3%. Yeah. So uh, basically to summarize some of that, in my opinion, I'm not sure if the gibber acid is necessarily needed, especially if you're an organic producer, you're probably not going to get your certifier to let you use GA3 on your trees. So if you're using this as a, a way to increase more flower production on your trees, then this might work. Um, also, potassium nitrate is not allowed for an organic certifier. So some of the future work, um, I think Ken was talking to me earlier about using 0052 as one way to stimulate flowering. So I think 0052 is an AMRI approved fertilizer, right? So um, maybe you can enhance that with a sodium nitrate product that's also AMRI approved in a combination with those two. So that nitrate, I believe is more just to initiate that shoot production. And then part of that potassium is what's producing that flower initiation. So if you combine that 0052 and the sodium nitrate where are both AMRI approved products, then you might be able to get away with in your organic production. Does that make sense? I haven't tested that out, but that's something that I probably will look into uh, for an organic grower. Just come over and test it anytime. I can come do that too. <laughs> um, yeah, so it, it, it evolves, this project kind of evolved into a way to, to run away from the anthracnose and pottery. It never was the intention to do so, but because I saw an increase in fruit set from those trees, that were pushed back two months. Um, it made me think about this as a mechanism in those wetter areas during that natural flowering period to kind of run away, just because you don't have flowers and fruit on that tree during that wet period when you need that water, right, to transfer that spores onto the fruit and the flower to create that pathogen. <laughs> so that might be a potential mechanism to get more fruit set because you don't have to deal with the rainfall issues. Um, 
and then looking into more varieties and how this technique responds to different varieties. If we can do this all year long on fruit trees, that'd be pretty neat. I would recommend not doing this consistently on the same tree. You probably will end up killing it if you go more than one fruit set per year. Um, I wouldn't try and force it to have full fruit loads three or four times a year because I don't think the tree can handle it probably. Um, I haven't tested the, <laughs> the, the overall um, capacity, I guess, of that tree to keep fruiting consistently all year long, uh, an individual tree, I should say. But if you have an orchard where you can split that up, it may be more practical to get fruit all year long. So you have that premium in those later months where nobody else is sending mangoes to the market currently. And that's all I have if there's any questions. Well, there's questions, so let me see if we can Let me stop sharing. It's a little bigger. Maybe. All right. Um, I know we had a few questions in the chat already. So let's see. Let me. <laughs> oh, okay. Just mainly from the recording. <laughs> um, if anybody has any questions, we'll open it up and. Um, Jensen, Lisa, and I are up here. If it's for Matt, we'll bring him over. <laughs> what do you use for uh, potassium nitrate? Just the regular granular crystals? Yep. Uh, wait, wait. What? So the question was, um, what do you use for potassium nitrate? In, is it just regular crystals or 50 crystals. pound bags? Yep. So crystals. Uh, I chose to go with uh, just a greenhouse grade water soluble potassium nitrate just so I could make sure that it will dissolve and get onto the tree canopy. How do you uh, get it in this solution? So I was for this project, I basically put that one liter in a two liter soda bottle because the it was just easy to mix it up inside there for that that small quantity. So I fill it up with water, I put in the potassium nitrate, I add my surfactant, which was a kinetic product. I just shake it in that bottle till it dissolves and then I pour that into my spray tank. And I just made one of those individually for each tree. That sounds. I wouldn't do that for an orchard, no way. <laughs> um, so ideally, you just mix a tank full of water. And if you have an agitator in your tank, you can dissolve it that way. If not, free dissolve it in a bottle as best you can, and then dump that into your spray tank and mix it in your spray tank to help break down that, that granular into a liquid form. It's usually pretty water-soluble water for potassium nitrate, though. And the rate of that, uh, I mean, a couple of potassium nitrate for, you know, how much, what's your ratio of weight? So the rate is that 3%. So it's just volume by volume or weight by volume, I guess. So, sorry, the question was, what is the rate for the potassium nitrate? So the way I calculated was at 30 grams per, per liter of water. So 30 grams per of potassium nitrate per liter of water. And then you just spray the amount of water it needed to cover the whole canopy. So it's not amount of product per tree, it's the concentration of product to get it onto the tree. Does that make sense? So you are weighing potassium nitrate and gibberellic acid. Per volume of water, yes. Yeah. No teaspoons, cups. No. You have to weigh. Yeah. Because <laughs> yeah, if you weigh it, you might get a totally different volume of product if you I mean, if you don't weigh it, you might get a totally different weight by the volume that you're measuring out, right? So to be a little bit more accurate, the weight of that product is a little bit easier to put in there. Now for you. <laughs> Have you tried more frequent application of essential oil for fungal control? No, so this was um, the first season. Um, and how many uh, treatment applications. But again, I think moving forward, we'll definitely try to increase the number. Um, looks promising for what we've done so far and excited to move forward and, and try a bit more, um, especially with the timing aspect. 
and there's no phototoxicity with the essential oils. That's correct. No phyto. I mean, it looked like you didn't apply anything. You know, we compared it to water. Um, we saw no difference, no no phyto effects at all. Yeah, you know, it's uh, as effective as sulfur. Um, well, fortunately, and thracnose wise in the field, there was virtually not evident, you know, as far as our data taking. It was post harvest that we saw, and they definitely seem to be in comparison. Both treatments, regardless, um, were very similar at that seven days, you know, right into just starting to get just beyond ripe. I mean, we started to see a difference between treatment methods, but fruit is overripe. And at that stage, I mean, there's no way, you know, good mangoes are hanging out that long anyway. Um, mm -hmm. Powdery mildew, there definitely was um, a difference in severity, um, maybe X to 2X, but it didn't seem to affect, you know, the number of fruit per panicle or uh, seeing premature drop because of the difference, the slight difference in field severity. So, so far, looking good. Keep our fingers crossed as we, you know, improve um, the number of treatments and the timing. Are these widely available? These um, essential oils. Yeah. So this product is um, Time Guard is is available. Yeah. Like I say, the one with the uh, tea tree oil. I mean, it, we're not moving forward with that here because it doesn't actually affect, um, doesn't inhibit our pathogens. How much does the Time Guard cost? Oh, that's a good question. I honestly, the question, how much does Time Guard cost? And I should know that, but I will get that information for you. <laughs> I think there was a question maybe for Jensen. Have you tried more frequent application of potassium nitrate to get more bud initiation? Um, if you mean on the same tree, no. Uh, each tree that I sprayed, I sprayed it once, just like I didn't want to push it harder than it could handle. Um, and that's where it gets into, if you keep spraying it with potassium nitrate, it might keep flowering, but the tree might not be able to handle that continuous fruit set and fruit load um, where you may end up killing the tree. So if you minimize it to where it's just one set of fruit on that tree for the whole year, then it might be able to handle that. You might be able to push it out to two per year because there's already some varieties that do push out two naturally. So that might be like the maximum. I don't honestly know because I've never tried to push a tree harder than I, I would like it to be pushed. So um, that's potential future work. If somebody's willing to let me test that out on their tree and are okay with that tree not being around, if I push it too hard, I'd be happy to spray the tree <laughs> once a month to see how much fruit you can get on that tree. In coffee, we consider that overbearing dieback when the fruit um, the fruit load is too heavy for the tree to handle. Um, next question, does orange oil help with mango disease? Good question. Um, we have not actually looked at it. I mean, the focus of this project uh, was the, the two products that are actually commercially available. So maybe um, we'll you know try to address some of this in the future but the concentration for this project um, was the tea tree oil versus the thyme oil. On uh, spring, to uh, induce flower and more flowering, if you could um, actually result in more flowering, you could be more selective in the number of fruit that you let set and, and to equal a uh, greater Poundage yield, but not uh, detrimental to the growth and health of the tree mm -hmm. by re, you know by regulating the amount of nutrients the fruit take from the tree, but yet result in higher yields and pounds. Yeah, I think my experience is the tree kind of will drop the fruit based on how much it can handle naturally. I don't naturally. know if that's everybody else's experience but yeah so some of these trees that i've pushed hard a lot of the fruit just falls off just because it naturally can't hang on to all those fruits but yeah you, if you spray it you basically 
put it to its potential, right? So it puts enough, as much flowers as possible, and the tree can determine how much it can handle versus having low amounts because of like disease pressure and whatever else, or poor flowering. So yeah, by spraying it early and getting more flowering, I guess you can push it to its maximum and then it'll tell you how much you can handle and drop it all off. Okay, you could do a control by not uh, being selective in the fruit as far as in intervening with the natural drop and to see if the frequency of spraying actually results in more drop in subsequent flowers. Yeah, so that's what I'm doing, I guess now is right. So I've been spraying it every month and then I've been counting how much fruit set as it goes on during the year. Oh, so you actually do that? Yeah. Come. So the July application was my last for this year, just because I wasn't sure how far I could push it into the year. But I mean, I just sprayed these trees, so a few of the trees up here last month, as well as on Oahu. So I can see how those trees are responding as far as holding on to those fruit, because that's likely going to be into January, February, when the tree should be naturally flowering again for their, their normal season. So. Uh, I'm kind of curious to see now what happens with that. So, how, how long you can extend that out to three years, four years? Or... The project is done, so I'm kind of done unless somebody wants to give me more money. Um, so, actually, <laughs> you just have data for one year. For two years, yeah, but for two years. Yeah. So, you can't really determine how often the frequency in future years whether this is detrimental to the tree or not. Exactly. So like I, I have a tree, right? A tree that I forced twice. Um, that's the only consecutive application data I have for off-season production, right? So because of the way the grant system works, I get two years to try and push this information out. So now I have a set of data and I have to go take that set of data and see if I can get more money to keep that more data coming in. I guess that's how the grant systems work, right? I don't get a pocket of money for 30 years. That'd be nice. If anybody wants to give me $100,000 every year for 30 years, I can definitely give you all the information you want from this off-season flowering, but it's probably not ever going to happen. But yes, I would like to keep keep this going. So I'm continuously looking for other funding to keep moving that information well, at least, forward. you know, up to five years. Yeah. Um, otherwise, it doesn't make sense for everybody to start jumping on a bandwagon yeah. and, and come to find out you need to kill the tree or you don't hear that much use. So, I mean, based on this, if you don't spray it, you get so much loss from rainfall in that area that I'm doing the project on that it, it seems to be fine if you keep going on, at least in two years, right? It's still better than if you didn't do anything because if you didn't do anything, you get five to six fruit per tree on average. But if you did something, you already quadrupled what you would have got if you didn't do anything, right? So. Um, as long as that tree still stays alive, I can keep spraying them every year. Um, I probably won't do this consecutively because it takes a day every month that I don't necessarily have to go and spray the trees because I have other projects I got to focus on. But I could probably do it once a year, at least on that set of trees, just to see if it stays alive for five years. But that's a good good point. Any research in other countries of the same type? I mean, other than did that, you research the research? Other than that publication on that, that whole physiological response, there's a lot of work on like stuff, but it, there's not a lot of field work. It's mostly like, I guess, lab work and just seeing their physiological responses. And I think those are, there's varieties that I just never heard of that don't seem as common to me from what everybody's growing. So um, this was trying to look at a variety I had available that's relatively common across. Yeah, check, check with Jonathan Crane, though, and try to I do definitely want to look into your 0052 and how that with and without potassium or sodium nitrate to see if yeah, you can increase the response. Because yeah. the publication, some say it's the nitrate that triggers the flowering. Um, and then you're telling me that the 0052 works. So is it the potassium in the potassium? It's just 0, 050 also. Yeah, yeah 0, 050. So just potassium, right? Yeah. So it's just the potassium that's triggering your trees to right. respond. So is it the potassium in the potassium nitrate that's triggering the flowering? And then the nitrate is just triggering the induction the of the shoot. Yeah. yeah. Because it's working on, on um, all the garcinians as well. And yeah. then sweetening 
and during its good foragers in, in Thailand and Malaysia, Vietnam, for during. So it's, it's just a good all around inducer. Yeah. You can use Suiso screens too, I think, to be something that. <laughs> right, Mark? <laughs> Really see that's those are also questions that oh so the question is how does the the fruit increase in value later on in the season and i think there's no answer for that because there's no fruit so well, you can sell it off season you yeah. can't sell it during the exactly season. so you have less competition off season so you can move the fruit a lot easier than if you had to compete with everybody else within the state. Um, one of the farms I work with on Oahu, I think it's, no, it's uh, Tommy Atkins is the rice they have. And last year they just had a flush of fruit off season. Um, and so they were able, they basically had trees flowering all year long, just randomly. So they were able to just move fruit real easy to any market that they want to move just because there was no other mangoes in the market during that period, right? So it's, it's going to be a matter of can the industry in Hawaii establish this market for locally grown off-season mango and demand the premium because one, hopefully nobody else in the world is sending mango to Hawaii and it's also a local premium product. So I can't tell you how much that's going to be. It's, it's going to be up to the industry to determine that price. Is that your question? Values there. Yeah, we had, a, we had an off-season harvest yeah. of substantial on the mangoes, and the local markets are willing to pay a dollar a pound premium. Yeah. Uh, so. so to do this, you have to control or or eliminate the normal flowering season to push your flowering season at a different time. That's going to be too much to so the question is, you have to put the tree in dormancy to initiate the flowering. And the answer is no. So the trees I showed you in the last few slides, those are all untreated with gibberic acid. They already had their fruit season, their natural flowering period for the year. I just came in and blasted it with potassium nitrate in, in, in August, right? So they're pushing out flowers now. So from the observation, I would say you can spray them at any time. As long as there's buds on them ready to break, to initiate the flowering, you can spray them at any time. So as long as the tree is in the right stage of growth, you can spray them. So if it's if the buds are dormant, you spray them, you might not get any response because there's no buds to flush any growth out, right? So um, if you want, I can show you some of the ones I picked on what might be a mature versus an immature bud. Um, but yeah, as long as there's on the tree, you can spray them, it'll flush. Um, and so far, all the varieties that I've sprayed it on seem to work. Uh, the the only benefit to the gibberic acid is to stop the flowering on that initial one, I think, um, so that you can trigger that tree earlier on for that May application. If not, you're gonna you're just gonna have loads of flower, and if you sprayed it, then you might not get any flower production because it's pushed all its flower energy out at that time. I don't know, so that's just my opinion. Um, but what we were seeing that if you had all that fruit drop and you came back in the next month and you sprayed it and there was mature buds on that plant, it'll push flowers out. Because a few of the control trees, because of the close proximity of that field, you'll get flower initiation just because there's drift of that potassium nitrate on that leaf area, on trees that already had flushed and dropped all their flowers already naturally. But if there's a full load of fruit on there, you probably don't want to force it to flower again because it's all its energy is going into that fruit load, so it probably won't handle another flush of growth or flower. I don't care if you do not set, you do not use flower at all this year. On one year, it had like a ton of fruit, and then the next year, yeah, yeah, we pruned it back severely, uh, but nothing. It's still a big tree. Um, do there's... you want to try and show even people on Zoom your uh, terminals? Do that. So I did forget to put that into the slides. So um, I just went up to the top and just grabbed some branches. So ideally you're looking for something that's mature. So this would be a, a more mature leaf where you start to see that darker green, the leaves are more hardy um, versus this immature shoot. 
which is typically lighter. Um, it's more succulent, the leaves. It's just flushed out. So this is probably not something you want to spray just because it already flushed out as a vegetative shoot. So it's not going to be able to put any flowers out. Where this one has uh, mature buds on the tip. And it's, it hasn't, so this is, these are two from the same tree. So it hasn't really pushed its energy out yet to push out the flower or vegetation, right? So um, ideally, this is something that you're looking for on your tree. If you can have it uniformly looking like this before this starts flushing out of your tree, that's probably a better time period. Um, I broke these off just so that it's a little bit easier to see the bud part of it. Um, I don't know if I can catch that on the camera, but usually the tip and then the areas where the leaves break off, there's a bud on top of there. So this one shows the swelling in that bud. So this is ready to turn into this at this time of year, right? But if you sprayed this at right now, you would probably get flower instead of the vegetative shoot. Um, that's what we were hoping on those trees. So you, there are flowers on there, just not as heavy as I wanted it to be for today's event. Um, but that's kind of what you're looking for. If you see something like this, where the shoots are starting to come out already, it's probably too late. It's already decided to be a vegetative shoot. So you can't tell it to be a flower once it's already decided to be a vegetative shoot. So basically these buds, there's the cells dividing right now and they're trying to decide what they want to be. And if you spray with the potassium nitrate, you kind of force it to decide to be a flower versus a vegetative shoot. And that's just, that's basically the idea behind that whole process. Hope you guys could see that online. So to be clear, what you're trying to achieve here is if you have a tree that's set with a bunch of fruit, you're not trying to set the fruit again because it's yeah. a load on the tree. But if you have trees that really didn't this year maybe didn't fruit, I mean didn't set real well, you're trying to spray those trees maybe to increase production for that year. Season, yeah. That would encourage that one time fruit. You're not trying to create it two times. I mean, you probably could, but right now at this point, I'm only recommending that it's just to increase the current season's fruit load. Like in our yeah. this year, we had, I don't know, the beans even really set for something. So there's probably still energy in that tree to maintain the fruit. So if you were to force the flower now, um, it may be able to handle that fruit load that's coming out just because it didn't have energy wasted on that previous season's fruit load. Right, right. Do you have uh, like notes or a draft form of that design for the uh, conversion to sort of uh, uh, leaf blower? Yeah. Uh, I have a. To distribute, like, yeah. you know, sort of... I have a white paper. I can send it to Andrew to send out to the group. Uh, it just gives a part list and kind of a step by step on how to do it. The video is currently being edited, as my time allows. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, there's a video coming on how to. Put, it's it's relatively simple. Um, if you wanted to, I could talk about it online on via Zoom. If you wanted, I could show you how to how I built it from Oahu. So that dark green branch that you have in your hand, yeah. that tip, that's where, you know, when you have low growing, growing mango and you want it to branch more. So I cut that tip off to promote two or three more branches to go off. That's the same one, right? That's that's at that stage where you spray. Yeah. Wait. Not sure if I understand. You don't. You're not cutting any tips off, though. I'm cutting the tips off so I can get two or three more branches. Yes. Two or more branches. So, so small... he's not he's not cutting these young growths, yeah. right? No. Uh, he wants these to grow, but then. Uh, when they're mature and dormant like this, he's trimming them back to encourage more branching. Yeah. Yeah. So before, yeah, be yeah. So so without, and so at a, at a point where you stop doing that, it will now produce a flower. Yeah. Uh, right. Yeah. So I mean, I would recommend that you make sure you're if you're doing this, you're making sure that the trees are getting adequate water, adequate fertilizer, and they're healthy enough to handle this added stress on them. Like any other plant, you want to make sure they're healthy. But making sure there's enough water, enough fertilizer to handle this unnatural fruit set is probably a, a good recommendation. Uh, let me try get some of these. There's a question. 
Uh, so the question is, notice heavy flowering often leads to more trouble with powdery mildew, perhaps moderate flowering through the year may be a good way to go. Um, so yeah, I think it, a lot of it's water related, right? So weather related. So if there's moisture on the plant, you, you'll get that heavy pathogen load, no matter if you have a lot of flower or a small amount of flower. So for this is, for, for at least for the potassium nitrate treatments, when you lose all those flowers, you can come back in and spray it again with the potassium nitrate to fill in what you lost from the um, disease. That's kind of one strategy to use this technique. Same with like if you had a poor, a poor fruit set anyway or flower, you can try and spray it later on to get more fruit on that same tree because it's probably healthy and big enough to put out more. I hope that answers that question and it wasn't a disease related question. No, no. Actually, though, I just wanted to reiterate um, anthracnose is really the disease um, that tends to be higher incidence and severity when it comes to the wet side. And powdery mildew um, favors a little more of the dry side. Yeah. Well, I definitely what the is mentioning is that that yeah, helps out the tree. I mean, less stress perhaps at certain times, and then that could also factor into the disease. So all I have data for is August is the latest I've sprayed. Um, you could probably spray it. I mean, it's it's probably naturally going to go into flowering right in December through um, January. So you probably don't want to waste effort and product all the way out to there. So probably November is probably the last time you want to spray because it's probably going to go through its natural flowering anyway. Um, if you wanted to increase your flower production during its natural flowering, then you can still spray it during that period, but it's going to trigger more flower initiation. That's the whole point of the potassium nitrate, right? So if you want to increase just your normal flowering season, you can also spray it with the potassium nitrate to try and increase the flower production for that normal season. A little confusion. You said the mildew is more prevalent on the leeward side. I thought it would be more on the leeward side where the uh, more water. No, so actually powdery mildew it is. It, it's it's less less wet issue. It's more of the dry side. And so particularly that's why we tend to see um, on our side here um, more of the issues in the field with powdery mildew. Um, that would be the opposite if you could then grow hilo in mango, good hilo and you know, mangoes in hilo, uh, but it would be more of the anthracnose issues with the moisture. Trees and disagree with you, but... Oh, good. I'm glad. To... Oh, really? So you do get a lot of powdery mildew. Flush three times in one year. I got zero all times in this year. But okay. It's, um, it's, it's, regardless, it, it happens in the worldwide. So it, I thought it was kind of interesting. I didn't know about trees. Yeah, but if you, I mean, if you're on Hilo side, you, I, I am too. So I'd be happy to come take a look. Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> all right, we're at about 1030 now. One last question for anyone online here. Thank you. Uh, this, the, I just grow my trees. So I have to find the options in the chart. I'm at the disability uh, units for all the parts, which I get you. This is about 120 feet. About the same height as the uh, Pokemon extension. And I know it's not, we didn't do it, but we didn't research, but uh, to, when should I spray the tobacco nitrate if we are still on the ability? And I don't want to stress them, but I'm sure they will bust when they come down. Do you have any thoughts with me, words of encouragement, and so on? So, the image I showed at the ends of the slide, that tree was one year in the ground and I sprayed it and it pushed out one panicle of flower. So you can spray it up to one, one year in the ground and it'll push out a set of flower. It's probably not going to hang on to maybe one fruit on that panicle, but you can spray it that early. I, I don't know if it's worth your time unless you want just one fruit from the tree. It's, I think like two to three years, it starts to get more mature. And then um, like four or five years old, it's is putting out more commercial yield. So that's this probably. Is, this is an older tree, which I cut that. And if I can't reach the fruit, you see, oh, yeah. So, um, 
but the, the branches are still weak and still getting strength. So I'm reluctant to have a fruit. However, at this point, one fruit is better than zero. So <laughs> well, in that case, if it's a it's a mature tree, but the vegetative growth is just immature. I think if you're if it's mature like this kind of mature where it's aged and it has the buds ready to push out another cluster growth i think you could probably get away with spraying it but i have not tested that out on an older tree that's just been freshly pruned and it has pushed out new growth i don't know what the response is going to be but i i'm assuming you could probably do it if, if the plant itself is mature enough to push out flower I'll give you my name and number. Yeah, that'll be cool to find out. Add that to the database. All right. Well, I guess we'll um, close this out. I wanted to thank our presenters here today. Thank you all on Zoom that continue to join us through the Q&A session, as well as you guys here in Kona. Um, good to see faces in person too. So um, we will send out an email and um, if you could please all give us your feedback, we'll send an evaluation for this event and we'll also send you the PowerPoints. And I think Jensen was gonna send the white paper on the potassium nitrate applications as well. So um, thank you very much and you guys all have a great day. For those of you here, we will just um, take a short break, bathroom break, snack break, and then we'll walk up to the station to see the trees. Thank you. Thank you.